Well, welcome. This is a response and conversation video to last week's lectionary text. Last week we, uh, we had the, uh, the parable of the talents from Matthew 25. There were uh, a few folks that, that wrote in, in uh, various, uh, uh, from various perspectives and positions, uh, some who wanted to share uh, things that they had learned, some who were utterly baffled, uh, and some who, uh, who were joining me in an ongoing conversation about what it may or may not mean. So uh, I want to invite you into that. Again, the lesson was from Matthew 25, starting at verse 14, and I will read it to you uh, just to get us all on the same page. Jesus said, For it as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. And then he went away. The one who'd received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who'd received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who'd received five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. The master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seeds. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was on my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we begin, and we begin with a bang. Regarding the Sunday message, I don't think I understand it. Was the message about faith? Was the person who got the one talent ridiculed because he buried his? I'm certain I'm way off on the meaning, as part of me felt that he was the one who showed goodness, knowing that the master didn't reap where he sowed, etc. I am so grateful for this question. It is really brave to stop everything and say, huh? It takes real courage and I appreciate it. So let's, let's go through it. And I'm not sure exactly where he went off the beam, so I'm just gonna do the whole thing. Uh, and, and I mean no offense, right? Okay, so a talent is a weight of precious metal, metal, usually silver. It's about 130 pounds. Now our word talent, right, an ability or an inborn gift, it comes from this story. That's where we got the word. That's the word, that's where we, where we took this word from. But it's not about being able to sing or being comfortable in front of strangers, at least in this story. Of course, by extension, it is. But in this story, a talent is 130 pounds of silver, right? So in the story, the master's going away, but he doesn't want his holdings to be unmanaged while he's gone. So he divides his cash holdings between three slaves, each according to their ability. One gets 650 pounds of silver, if you can imagine such a thing. One gets 260 pounds of silver, and one gets 130 pounds. Each of them gets a king's ransom. Each of them is entrusted magnificently. And then the master leaves. And two go right to work managing the master's money, and over time they double what they received. One buries the money in the ground so as to avoid losing it. And when the master returns, he demands an accounting. 
The two that have grown the master's holdings are celebrated and they're rewarded. And the one who buried the money is condemned as wicked and lazy and he's thrown out of the household. He, he tries to explain himself and he says that he knew that the master is a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. You quite rightly point that out. But the master will have none of it. The master says, in effect, if you knew that about me, you would have given my money to the bankers. Then I would have had my original silver back, plus a good deal of compounded interest. If I'm the kind of man that you think I am, you did exactly the wrong thing. Your rationalization doesn't match your behavior. It makes no sense. The point for us, or at least one of the points for us, is that God has gifted each one of us and expects a return. The gifts and the talents that we've been given are supposed to be used to increase God's holdings. We're warned that it won't be acceptable to simply refuse, to simply sit on our gifts. Whatever our definition of sin, it has to include punching out. That won't be tolerated. We believe there'll be an accounting. We acknowledge that we are called to be at work anticipating that day. And on that day, there'll be no comparisons between me and you or anyone else. Again, there's no grading on a curve. What you do with your gifts, with your life, has absolutely no bearing on my ultimate meeting with the Master. Any time or energy I spend judging you or comparing myself to you or to anyone else is wasted energy, wasted time. Each one of us will simply be accountable to God for what we did with what we received. From the one who has received much, much will be expected. Christianity isn't a matter of praying some prayer or responding to some altar call. It's to be a way of life. It's a family business. It's an eternal progression. It's a movement, a call, a path, a purpose, a consuming occupation. The master will return someday. May he find us at work. I hope that helps. Someone else wrote in, regarding our God-given gifts, do we search hard enough to determine our gifts? Do we listen to his call to use our gifts? Do we follow his calling? If all would use their gifts for service of others, would all the needs of others be satisfied? It would seem that that would be his plan. And we need to judge only ourselves in this. So the three certainly rhetorical questions. Do we search hard enough to determine our gifts? Do we listen to his call to use our gifts? Do we follow his calling? I think it's pretty obvious that the answer there that's expected, that is true, is no. We don't search or struggle to discover what has been entrusted to us. We don't listen to God's call. We don't follow. We're all clear on that, right? More challenging would be the why. Why don't we do any of those things? Well, I, I have a laundry list of possibilities, and when you find yourselves, hold on to it, because that's, that's important for each one of us to know. So some of us don't believe that our gifts actually come from God. We believe that we're self-made, self-actualizing, accountable only to ourselves. The main challenge for us in this story is the premise itself, that everything we have, every gift we have, comes from God as a sacred trust. Some of us don't believe that. Some of us also don't believe that there'll be an accounting. The master has been gone a long time. So long that his return seems desperately unlikely. There's no pressure to perform. It doesn't matter. Some of us have contempt for the community of faith. We think that the church has nothing to say and can offer no guidance about our gifts and about their use. Some of us really do believe that judgment's on a curve. It's like camping with a group in bear country. You don't need to be the fastest person in your group. You just can't be the slowest. The slowest gets mauled. 
and we figure that the Day of Judgment will be pretty much the same. As long as we can stand next to someone who's done worse, we'll probably be okay. And that lie runs deep in us. We spend an awful lot of time and energy rationalizing our lack of faithfulness and our lack of effort. Some of us are afraid. We don't believe that God has gifted us with exactly what we need to do God's will, and we don't trust the wisdom and the foresight of God. Some of us just clean hate accountability in all its forms. And some of us are wicked and lazy. Wherever each one of us finds ourselves on this list, there's an opportunity today for confession and for amendment of life. And my sister who wrote in, you are quite right in your belief that if we all used our gifts in service of the coming kingdom, a great deal of the brokenness and want in this time would be caught up in the restoration of all things. For example, Luther was very clear that there was plenty of food in the world. The reason people starve, he thought, is because of our broken and our sin-filled systems of distribution and provision. In the same way, God has given us the gifts we need to care for one another and to expand the kingdom. If only we would. Or someone else wrote in, on to the parable, wondering, if God forgives our sins as we confess them and he also wipes them away, why will we have to account for them on the last day? Aren't they already forgiven? It's such a good question, isn't it? My very great teacher, Gerhard Ferdy, was fond of saying, our life in Christ can be thought of like this. Now that there's nothing for you to do, what are you going to do? The echoes of his voice in my heart and in my mind drove me to stress so carefully in the initial sermon that these three servants are part of the household of the master and then richly gifted by the master before there is the first syllable about them working or doing. They're in. They belong. They're rich. Now what do they decide to do? And what do they actually do? Your sins are forgiven. You have been caught up in the work and life and passion of Christ. You are baptized. You're rich beyond all measure. And nothing can take you out of Christ's hands. Now what are you going to do with all of that? Get in the game. Be brave. Try stuff. And it's not that you have no idea what sort of work God values. You do know. It's not as if you've received no instruction about how we ought to live and pursue God's priorities. And it's not as if any of us are wrestling alone. We have the scriptures and the tradition, our pastors and our teachers and the blessed community of faith. But yeah, we'll never be certain that we're doing as we ought. Philip Melanchthon was Luther's student and heir, 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 and he was once asked, how do we know what to do? How can we be sure? We're so blind. We make so many mistakes. And Melanchthon's response? Sin boldly. You don't know what to do? Sin boldly. Do something big. Jump in, go big, roll the dice. If you err, God can and will forgive you. If you rightly discern, God can bless your efforts magnificently. You understand, sister who wrote in, I'm not talking to you this directly. This is to all of us. This is to me. But we do learn here that sleeping in the light is not an acceptable way to spend our time once we have been graced and gifted by Christ. Uh, another, uh, another idea, the man entrusted with the one talent buried it because he was afraid of being treated harshly. That was thought provoking for me. How many times have I let fear of some form stop me or delay me from doing what I knew was best? Taking action, even when I'm afraid, it's only possible if I have faith that things will work out. And then she remembers the, the prayer from, from the, the father of the sick child when Jesus comes down from the mountain of transfiguration. Right? Uh, I remember to use the phrase or the prayer, I believe, please help my unbelief. Remember, the, the Bible teaches us that perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. You belong to God. 
you know that Jesus honors incomplete faith. He did heal this father's son. And you know that he loves us so much that he died to bring us home. You have been gifted by God and the angels breathlessly await the exercise of your gifts. Your prayer is perfect. I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And get started. Last thing. As I think about this parable, I'm reminded that, as you said, everyone has been given at least one talent. That on the last day, we will have to account for how we used that talent. This is actually an excellent time for me to focus on that, as I've been very frustrated with, and then lists a bunch of stuff, all the stuff that's going on in our society, in our country, and in the world. I know we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world, and are supposed to be grounded by eternity. But I get pulled into all this noise very easily. Anyway, the lesson couldn't have come at a better time. To which I'll simply say amen. Ignore the noise. Focus on responding with love to the one who has given you everything and who is yours forever. And someday you will hear that blessed voice saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. May God protect and keep us all in faith as we await for that glorious day. Be well, my friend.